a delusion in the theory of subversion. There are political and social visionaries who hotly and eloquently demand the overthrow of all orders, in the belief that the proudest temple of fair humanity would then immediately rise up on its own. That's the first part of aphorism 463 of Nietzsche's Human All Too Human. And what the aphorism is about is the nature of the revolutionary progressives and how that essentially gets in the way of genuine progress. Because in the first case, we have the, the constructive types who want to destroy what exists to allow the natural brilliance of human nature to uh, express itself unfettered. Now, in the modern world, there's two different branches of this revolutionary political attitude. The first is the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, which is the extension of Marxism. And Marx, of course, was uh, somewhat familiar to Nietzsche. He was certainly aware of the socialist in general. Um, and the Frankfurt School is a continuation of Marx. So the distinguishing feature of that school is that they want to overthrow the current order of society but they don't really have a plan for how society is going to function afterwards because the idea they have is that while we are constrained within this sick society and we are forced to operate according to its strictures we are unable to imagine a different order of things so first priority for the frankfurt school style of people of philosophers is to overthrow the current order the second group of visionaries is the postmodernists who believe that truth is not something that is attainable through logic and reason no amount of rigor will ever get to pure complete truth and so trying to go after it and rejecting things based on not meeting the requirements for getting to absolute truth is inappropriate so what they want to do is they want to deconstruct this notion of truth so that its influence can stop being such a blight on what would be left over so again it's not exactly the same as the critical theorists who are uh, Marxist in their basic framework but it does involve the same notion that deconstruction is the fundamental process it's just that the motivation is different for the Frankfurt School the motivation is that they want the revolution so that they can have a new type of human nature so human nature is brilliant whereas for the postmodernists they just don't think that there's any possible way of heading toward truth and logic so the first group the frankfurts want to overthrow order for the sake of beautiful human nature whereas the postmodernists just don't believe in order so they think the only thing that is left is human nature in these dangerous dreams there is still the echo of rousseau's superstition which believes in a wondrous innate but as it were repressed goodness of human nature and attributes all the blame for that repression to the institutions of culture in society, state, and education. In this next part of aphorism 463, Nietzsche mentions Rousseau, who was the philosopher who underpinned the French Revolution. And it's a classic example of what he's talking about, is the French Revolution, because what happened there was there was a certainly stale and decadent aristocracy, and it was overthrown on the principle of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, those are certainly some high and respectable human ideals, humanistic ideals. But despite the nobility and the brilliance of the ideals that justified the revolution and motivated the revolution, it did not stop the release of barbaric human impulses coming to the surface. The mistake made by the philosopher Rousseau was to believe that man's nature is beautiful that if we are to get rid of these oppressive institutions like the French aristocracy, that the natural beauty of man will just have the opportunity to express itself. He doesn't recognize that in each individual there is evil. It's not just that it comes from being tarnished and spoiled by the excesses of decadent authority, but it springs up naturally of its own accord. Unfortunately, we know from historical experience that every such overthrow once more resurrects the wildest energies, the long since buried horrors and extravagances of most distant times. 
An overthrow can well be a source of energy in an exhausted human race, but it can never be an organizer, architect, artist, perfecter of the human character. Here Nietzsche mentions the inevitable result of the overthrow, which is the release of the barbaric energy inherent to human nature. So, as I already said, Rousseau has the concept that humans are fundamentally good and are caused to be bad by their indoctrination by society. But the fact is, if we look at history, and we look at evolutionary history in particular, it is just clearly the case that violence and barbarism isn't the result of training. It isn't the result of indoctrination. It is natural. There is something to be said about the um, spoiling of the natural, or the increasing cruelty that comes with socialization, where we have the case of the, the inquisitors, the Christian saints, and the Christian uh, missionaries who went out and burned and pillaged and tortured people, uh, all according to themselves for the sake of good. So there is this one exception, but the fact is, raw human violent energy, having no cap on it, or no restraint, is going to be released, and that it is horrific. So, by getting rid of the order, by getting rid of that limiting, filtering principle, you release uh, destructive energy. You also release creative energy, which is what di the idea of Dionys Dionysus often is. But it has to be uh, compensated with a uh, creative sculpting energy. You can't just go into release and leave it there. That's not enough. You need to cultivate the energy that you release. If you just release energy, and then it's inevitable that that energy will be bad. And just releasing is not going to lead inevitably to cultivation. The cultivation itself has to be active and effortful. The instinct just to the mere release, releases only destructive energy. It is not Voltaire's temperate nature, inclined to organizing, cleansing, and restructuring, but rather Rousseau's passionate idiocies and half-truths that have called awake the optimistic spirit of revolution, counter to which I shout, écrasez l'infâme, crush the infamous thing. Because of him, the spirit of enlightenment and of progressive development has been scared off for a long time to come. Let us see, each one for himself, whether it is not possible to call it back again. The conclusion of this aphorism is the wisdom I want to end with, and that is that the adolescent attitude toward revolution is actually going to discourage progress. Progress is not something that happens easily, and it takes effort. It does require the rejection of tradition, but not in an adolescent way where we throw things off and hope to be immediately free from all suffering. We have to be free from tradition and doctrine and dogma but we will never be free from suffering. So, we still have to acknowledge the fact that uh, even though dogma is a huge obstacle to progress and truth and enlightenment, it does have a value which is to repress barbarism. So there's a moral value even to a fascist state, which is that it prevents people from being violent. So, um, we have to Repress that barbarism so that we are able to have progress. Without the repression of barbarism, we can never have progress. Um, so, again, suspicion of tradition is good for progress. That's what we need. We need to not just trust in history and authority, but at the same time, authority has the value that it crushes the barbarism, which is also necessary. So we have to move forward, which is effortful, right? If we're going to escape our little village in the woods, it doesn't mean that we get to just be free to run around and do anything, because then we'll be eaten by snakes, bitten by snakes, bitten by spiders, eaten by tigers. So if we want to escape the tradition, we want to escape the suffocating, dogmatic nature of society and history, we actually open ourselves to more danger. We can't expect to get away from the danger. In the same way, if we're going to try and change society, so that we aren't following the same strictures we have to be very careful because we're going to open ourselves up to the release of those barbaric passions so with postmodernism and critical theory what we end up with is the release of those passions um, because the whole idea is that all dogma is bad we must get rid of it but then those passions come out and then human nature 
because it wants security and safety. The release of those patients immediately is followed by a fascist control of those patients. So that's exactly what happened in the French Revolution where it was the Rousseauian notion where we throw out all dogma, get rid of the king and we have self-governance. But then immediately that self-governance descended into the worst fascism, far worse than the king himself, and culminated in the terror where 40,000 people were executed by guillotine. Um, so basically the wisdom of this last passage here is that we want progress, so therefore we must abhor revolution. We do not want to embrace tradition, but we do not want to throw it, the baby out with the bathwater. So basically we've set ourselves a difficult task, and that means it's going to be difficult. So the idea that there'll be a utopia is a delusion. It is an adolescent attitude toward philosophy in the future. And if we really want to make progress, we have to subject ourselves to the pains of this ambivalent middle ground.